Hi everyone and a massive, massive welcome to AXA Coral Live and this lesson all about caring for coral. Really, really looking forward to taking you through this lesson. We're broadcasting live from the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curacao. You can probably hear the waves behind me. We're just uh, off the reef here and in fact we have coral growing on the pillars of the jetty just behind me. We're down in the Southern Caribbean at a research station and it's wonderful to be here in this community of scientists helping us all to understand this wonderful, wonderful underwater environment a bit better. So at Kermabi, it's our home for these two weeks. It's a home for, for scientists from around the world and they're all here studying various aspects of the coral reef. And the great thing about the research station, not only is it close uh, to the coral reef and a few other bugs around me at the moment, uh, but it also has amazing research facilities. So scientists can do that research, help us understand how the coral reef works. And by doing that, that gives us a foundation the basic information to begin to take action to make sure we have a healthy coral reef in the future. And it's my great pleasure to welcome to Coral Live one of the scientists from Curacao. Rene, thank you so much for being part of this live lesson on caring for coral. Thanks for inviting me. Um, we, we have some great schools and we've got some shout outs uh, to give for the students. We've got hello to the Bengal Tigers, and they are at Kiverton Park Meadows Junior School. Hi to all the Bengal Tigers. Hi, great to have you with us. And we've got some homeschoolers as well. We've got um, Elsa and Louis, and they're in Suffolk in the UK. Hi, Elsa and Louis. And we've also got a shout out to year four, five, and six at uh, Isa Primary in Newport, South Wales who are really enjoying learning about coral at the same time as they're learning about COP26 and climate change. So it's really great to pull that all together for the students yeah. at the ISA uh, primary um, during this live lesson. Uh, Rene, we, 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 we've got a fantastic uh, topic to discuss, uh, but I think we're going to start off with by sharing some video okay. of, of, of the reefs and what would be great um, we're going to show you uh, two videos of the reef uh, and what we would like to hear back from you is an emotional response how do these videos uh, make you feel and you can do that in one of uh, three ways uh, you're, you may be using the student sheet attached to this lesson and there's a, an area at the top of that student sheet just to note down your responses. You may also gather those as a class, get them written up on the board to share them with us, which would be fantastic, as well as all your questions. Please do use the interaction app to the side of the video. If you do have the video full screen at the front of the classroom, a teacher or other adult uh, can get the live stream uh, up on a, another device like a like a like a, a, a phone, and they can submit to make your responses there because we, we would love to, to hear what those are. Um, but we're going to start rolling. I think to start off with this like this this sort of video of a a healthy reef. Um, as, as students are, are watching this, what, what kind of things can we sort of point, point out to them that they might, might see on a healthy reef, Rene? Um, well, uh, quarries are called quarries for a reason. Uh, it's because most of the base uh, structure that you'll see is made up of corals, which are in fact animals. And they form, they cover most of the bottom of the reef. Um, and that bottom keeps growing upwards as the corals grow larger. And on top of that, because the water is so clear, you can often look very far 
you see many kinds of fishes, uh, perhaps turtles or rays if you're lucky. Um, and therefore you get a very colorful system with many, many different animals, both on the bottom as well as higher up in the water. And all of that together gives usually a very great and lively image. And it's always amazed me the amount of movement you can see uh, compared to a forest where you're sort of used bog, the amount of movement you can see yeah. when, when you're looking at a coral reef Yeah, underwater. definitely. Um, because like you say, the, the trees don't block your view. So you can usually look a lot further and therefore you tend to see a lot more animals and it just it looks so busy. Uh, a bit like in, in Finding Nemo, you see all the fish jumping in and out of the, behind the structure, coming back out. There's a lot going on at the same time. And, and, and the, 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 what students may see um, is also a, a couple of different types of coral, not just the shapes of hard coral, but also this wavy coral. What, is, that, is that just a young one or is it not fully formed or is that something different? You know, it's, it's, it's something, at the one hand, entirely different because it looks so different, but they're family of each other. Um, so corals is a very diverse family of animals. Um, they're also family to the jellyfish, which are essentially corals that are free living and can swim about the water. Uh, and the corals that you see on the bottom are jellyfish that have adapted and have attached to the bottom and grow there now. And these fans that you're referring to, those is what we call sea fans, uh, which is another type of coral altogether, but still a, a coral. And they do not uh, usually form the sort of hard skeleton that other corals are known to do but uh, rather grow up into the water column and then get pushed about by the currents and the waves. And, and Rene, um, just while uh, classes are finishing off, uh, you know, noting down that their emotional response, sh hopefully sharing that with us, what or how did you feel the first time you, you dived on, on, on the coral reef? Well, I was very young the first time I was on a coral reef because I was born and raised here on Curacao. So I was exposed to it from, from a young age. Um, of course, things that come to mind immediately are, are beauty, um, uh, wonder, perhaps I would, I would even say awe because it's so, you know, it, it, it sort of takes your breath away every now and then because what you see is so impressive. So I think those are, are good emotions for me to describe what I, what I think of when I see it. Rene, thank you so much for those comments. I mean, not only do we get amazing, healthy reef here, very sadly there are, there are areas which, which aren't so healthy. And, and I think that we can, we can start to show that video there. And again, it would be great to, to start noting the, those emotional responses. In, in, in terms of looking at a, a degraded and unhealthy reef, what, visually, um, what are the types of things that you might notice? Um, I think the two most striking things that you'll notice uh, probably straight away is one, the lack of color. A lot of things on a degraded reef have died and are in the process of being decomposed. So the, the color is being taken out. And the other thing that you will probably see is there's a lot less happening. There's a lot fewer fish, uh, fewer other animals, both in the water column as well as on the bottom. Um, and it just looks so quiet. There's nothing going on. And, you know, I, I think we've also got some footage of, some, of what looks like very bright, sort of almost fluorescently white or sort of almost those kind of neon colors. Yeah. Um, and, and that looks like it could be really cool, but, but what, what's happening when you see that kind of thing underwater? Um, so when a coral is healthy, the... Um, okay, let me, let me take that sentence one step back. A coral is really an animal, um, not very much like uh, most of the animals that you'll see on land, in that it doesn't have a very well-defined structure, doesn't have a head and eyes, uh, a mouth or arms and legs but it's a very basic animal nonetheless. It basically really consists of a mouth and tentacles. And with these tentacles, it grabs food, puts it into its mouth and it digests it and it will live from that. But corals have a, a different means because they're so sort of, um, yeah, let's, let's just use the word basic for now. They're such basic animals. They have an additional means of feeding themselves. And they do that by having a very, uh, tiny algae, which is like a plant really, 
inside of their tissues. And it's the algae inside those tissues of the coral that give it its color. Now, when the coral is healthy, there's lots of algae in the tissue. And then the coral can look anywhere from uh, red or purple. You can have blue. Many corals are, in fact, brown, green, yellow. Um, so you have all these different colors. Um, but that color comes really from the tiny microscopic algae inside it. Now, when this relationship is not doing very well, because, for example, the coral has a lot of stress, those algae are being removed. And then the coral goes back to what we could call its original color, which is very white. And therefore, when you see corals that appear to be very pale or even white, it means the corals are very stressed. And you, the whiter the coral gets, the more stressed they are because the fewer algae are left. And if that condition persists for very long, the corals could eventually even die. Okay, well, thank you for that visual description. I imagine we've got a number of emotions, emotional words uh, that, the, that the students are writing down. When, when, when you, you are doing your work, I mean, obviously, sometimes you may even be looking for unhealthy reefs. H how, how does that make you feel? Um, yes, yeah, sad, obviously. Um, I feel a great sense of waste. Um, I feel like we're losing something, something that is very important to me. Um, I sometimes get angry. I can get frustrated every now and then. Um, disappointed also, uh, especially when I look at the behavior of uh, my fellow humans. So yeah, yeah, usually quite uh, sad overall, negative. Okay, we've got some of the um, responses coming back um, from students. So we have the healthy reef, uh, students were mesmerized, amazed and in awe at the beauty, happy, relaxed. Uh, relieved because it's nice that I don't have to worry, uh, happy, and then for the unhealthy reef, uh, and we'll, we'll talk through some of these emotions and, and how we can work, work through them. Sad, very sad, angry, sad and angry. Uh, sad uh, because it's not very nice for the ocean, depressed and, and bad. And, and I think it, it's... Um, we, we, we've talked about the emotional response. I, I, I wanted to sort of maybe to go, and we were planning to go talk about your career and you know, the importance of, of, of science. Um, but perhaps first off, to address some of the students' emotions and, and, and support them in that emotional journey that, that they, 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 they're going through. Um, you, you mentioned that you also uh, feel sad and, and angry when you see uh, an unhealthy reef, and you feel awesome when, when it's, you know, in, 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 in the bounteous underwater world. How, how do you deal with that sadness and that anger uh, as someone who, who experiences these yeah. differences on a, on a very regular basis? Yeah. Um, no, I, I completely understand a lot of the responses that were given. I relate to those very much. Um, it's very similar to, to what I feel personally both as a human being as well as as a researcher. I know that for my work, I often have to study reefs that are in very bad shape to learn from them. Um, I feel mostly angry because I know it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I feel disappointed because I know that a lot of this is our own fault. Um, not anyone per se, but you know, the whole way we have structured our lives and what we've been doing for the last, say, 50 to 100 years. Um, I feel sometimes disappointed because sometimes I'm not able to make as much of an impact as I'd like to make. And then both disappointed in others as well as sometimes in myself. Um, at the same time, though, although it sounds very negative, um, I get a lot of joy when I see healthy reefs. There are still quite a lot of healthy reefs around, um, sometimes surprised because you can find something really nice where you don't expect to find it. Um, I can sometimes feel proud when I see the things that um, the people in the scientific community and other places have done 
to preserve healthy reefs and make sure that they don't die. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And I think today we should probably focus more on the, on the positive emotions or perhaps in the ways that we can take negative emotions and use them, for example, to motivate some of you to do something about them. Because when I feel, say, angry, I, I often wake up angry in the morning when I, when I pull up the news of the day and I look through and I think, oh, really? Are we, are we really doing all this again? And it sort of motivates me to go out and try to do something against it. So you, you take something negative and try to turn it into something positive that gives you energy and, um, and sort of uh, motivates and, um, and, and gets you out there to, to try to do something about it. And, 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 and Rene, I'm going to ask you to to sort of big yourself up a bit because you've, you've done huge amounts of research over the past 15 years. And, Wouldn't and necessarily say you, huge, but I've... Yeah, amounts of research. I mean, you've yeah. been working on this, your, your, you know, it's been your career. Yes. Uh, you you are, are part of this huge community of scientists around the world. How does science help us? And if I can ask you a, a sort of follow-up question, what has made you particularly proud? Um, and playing your role as part of this community. Yeah, um, it's, it's very true what Jamie says. There's, um, I'm not the one doing science. There's, there's many, many, many people like me. And there are so many biologists, but not just that. There are physicists, there are uh, social scientists, there are people who work in policy, management, conservation. All of us are doing a really, really small amount in our own respect. But together, when you add it all up, it's, it's really a lot. Um, in my personal field as a scientist, what we are really trying to do more than anything um, is, is we're very curious, obviously, uh, as to how things work, what makes something work, what makes everything work. All these discoveries are really new and, and uh, surprising and entertaining. They're super interesting. And the result of that is that we understand the system better and better, and we know more about it every time. And that helps us, obviously, to inform people, uh, both at home as well as the people taking decisions, for example, in the government or in the media, to become more engaged, to take better decisions. The decisions are sort of uh, more pointed towards really accurate solutions. And science is, of course, the basis of that. So without the science, if you don't know how something works or why something behaves the way it does, then it's really difficult to try to come up with solutions, for example, in order to restore a degraded reef back to a healthy reef. And I'm going to ask you, um, I mean, it's amazing to, you know, the, the importance of science there. Uh, through understanding, we can take appropriate action at whatever level, from the individual all the way to, to government. Uh, just to share uh, with, with the classes watching, is there something you're, you're particularly proud of in your career to date? I know you've um, avoided that. Just yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, uh, a little bit. Um, I'm not so proud uh, as to anything I've done personally. I think I could do a lot more. I hope to do a lot more in the future. But I'm very proud of the steps we have made as a overall community as a whole. I think the amount, on the one hand, we have really done a lot of good work to communicate whatever are the things that we find, because they're often really complicated and not easy to understand by a lot of people. So we really try to involve these people by making it understandable to them. On the one hand, on the second uh, part, in, especially in the last five to 10 years, you really see that a lot of people are mobilizing because of some of the work that uh, many of my colleagues have been doing, that really see what's happening, understand what's going on, and feel compelled to go out and do something about it. And although my part in that is, is incredibly minimal, because you're part of the whole, you do, in a way, feel proud about it, even though I don't feel proud personally, if you know what I mean. I, I, I do, do, do know what you mean um, completely. and. I think we're, we're, we're going to come on here to uh, four areas, uh, and that's how uh, four areas that science, the science community at large, has, have identified uh, for coral to be healthy. 
and those four areas are on your worksheet and over the, the rest of the lesson what we're going to do is you know understand those a little bit more and think about some of the actions we can all take uh, to make sure those conditions stay for the coral reef to be healthy into the future. So I think we've got those four areas as a stable environment, as uh, safe from harm, from harmful things being put in, having lots of friends. I think these are probably things that can apply to us as well as to the coral reef and, and having our, our voice heard. Um, just briefly before we get into the sort of a discussion driven by student questions, can you uh, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, each of those four? And if we start with a stable environment, what kind of stable environment uh, does, does a coral um, like? I would say rather than like, more needing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, this might sound very familiar and you'll probably be aware of many stable environments. Um, for example, around the home, uh, in nature, if you go and take a walk in a forest, many times when you come back, I, I know there are seasons and all, but, but generally if you look at what you find when you go back to the same place twice is that it looks very much the same. Um, that is for a good reason. Our climate has been very stable over the last couple of thousand years. Um, with the result that a lot of animals have been very much adapted to that. They perform really well under, let's just say, uh, a certain set of conditions. And corals are no different. Now, when you start to mess with those conditions that a coral is used to growing in, there's all sorts of negative impacts it can have. Um, I guess a good analogy could be perhaps that um, for example, a job for a person, if you've had a steady job and a steady income and you're able to support yourself and your family, that all works very well. And, and, and there's even a bit of plenty and you get to do extra. When one month you have an income and the other month you don't, people start to get stressed. You know, what am I going to find next month? A coral doesn't think about that rationally the same way way a person does but the same principle applies so when things become very unstable say for example temperature goes up and then down the corals find that really difficult to cope with that as well actually i should say a lot of other animals do too when the temperature changes a lot uh, for us also it becomes very difficult to to function if temperature is too high or too low it's just with corals is that that range of of conditions under which they are able to function is much narrower than with a lot of other systems. So they're, I would say, particularly vulnerable. And, and we're, we're talking here just uh, a few degrees rise in temperature in the ocean yeah. can have uh, very negative impacts on coral health. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, li like we mentioned, the corals are attached to the bottom. They cannot move. Uh, unlike us, they cannot put on a sweater if it's colder or they cannot uh, perhaps take the sweater off if it gets warmer. Uh, they can also not migrate. They cannot, um, for example, a lot of birds migrate south in winter because it gets too cold up north. Corals can't do any of that. They're really stuck to their location, which means that if the conditions there become unfavorable, they either have to deal with it or they run the risk of dying. So, so moving from stable environment um, to looking at sort of safe from harm, what are some of the things that we put into the ocean, uh, even if you're in the UK, uh, that affect the whole health of the ocean? Yeah, um, no, that's a, that's a very good point. And here what you see a lot, I mean, because the ocean is such a big area, you might think that something that happens very, very far away has no influence elsewhere. But it's not exactly true, because a lot of the ocean currents transport things from one location to another. There are big, big ocean currents, you know, on the, on the scale of, of, of countries, hundreds or, or thousands of kilometers. And so, for example, plastics and other waste products that get thrown into sea um, thousands of kilometers, like say at the other, at the 
opposite end of the ocean can travel here over time. They can pollute the reefs. Uh, you've mentioned temperature, which is a very big thing uh, globally because the overall temperature is increasing. Uh, other forms of pollution that are not necessarily visible, for example, chemicals, have very bad effects. They can make the corals sick. Uh, they can spread disease. All of these things um, play, play a big role and they can cover huge distances because it's all connected. Rene, thank you so much for, for sharing that connection within the ocean, the ocean currents, and, and it, it's one big ocean. It's one big ocean, yeah, they're not separated, yep. even though they look separated because there's so much space in between. You know, things could travel back and forth very easily, and, and something bad from one place have a negative impact on another place. I, I think the, 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 the next section that we're going to look at is, is having lots of friends. Now, one of the things I certainly noticed when, when, when you're on a healthy section of reef here, and you've seen that in the video, is, is how many other animals are around the coral. Why is it important for coral to have all this other life? Um, well, when you think of a coral reef, imagine it as a, as a complete system that needs all the individual parts, let's say the animals, the corals, the fish, the mammals, you, dolphins are on coral reefs, uh, turtles, all of those are in a way links that complete a whole thing. Now if you take one of those links out, all the other parts are not able to function as well as they've done with that link in. And some links are more important than others, obviously, but as with everything, when you take one part out, it's not complete anymore. Um, you cannot run a car on everything but its tires. So you, you need the whole thing in order to have a functional whole. And, and I, I don't know what we, we, we can show you, uh, for example, one of my favorite fish here is the parrotfish. Yeah. I don't know if we, we can show some, some parrotfish uh, as we talk about it. But just give an example of, of how, does, how does a parrotfish actually help coral stay healthy? Um, as you probably see or have seen maybe in, in, in the videos here, or, there's a lot of different kinds of fish and you have, uh, one of them is, is the parrotfish. Parrotfish is a very important fish for coral reefs. We call them parrotfish, by the way, because they usually have, they have a bit of a parrot-like beak and they have very flamboyant corals often, uh, colors often. And what the parrotfish does, it has a unique role on a coral reef in that it eats algae and algae are, uh, they are very much like plants, though they're not exactly the same, but let's ignore that for now. On a, on a reef, normally, even in healthy conditions, you have a lot of algae that grow and they compete with corals for space. So there's the bottom of the reef and then you have in places that corals grow and in other places algae grow. The, the coral and the algae, they have a constant competition for the amount of space where they grow. Now, when parrotfish eat the algae, they open up space for the corals to occupy. And many, there are some parrotfish that also eat corals, but most of them don't. So what they do is they clear the algae and then corals can grow. So when you take away the parrotfish, the algae will grow freely. Nothing sort of mows them down from the top. And then they stand, in some cases, they can overgrow the corals. And then you get that the corals disappear in favor of the algae. Thank, thank you, Rene, so much. The, the, the last section, uh, making sure Coral has a voice, Rene sort of covered his voice as a scientist there, how the, the, the greater community of, of scientists are, are getting this more in the, in the news. And, and um, for, for adults in, in your life, will have probably seen more stories about Coral over the years. But I really want to get to, to, to the questions now amazing questions and, I, and I'm so impressed uh, by all of these, all the classes watching, the, the level of question we're getting from you um, is, is quite astounding. Um, and and the, the, the most popular question here, um, and it's, it's quite a sad one in, to start with, but I think we need to address it, are there more unhealthy reefs than healthy reefs in the world? Oof, that's a difficult question. Um... I, I honestly don't really know, um, and, and for this reason, it's very difficult to 
say whether a reef is only healthy or only unhealthy. At the moment there are many reefs that are still looking good but are in the process of becoming unhealthy. I would say that that probably covers the majority of reefs. Um, but it doesn't mean that all of them are strictly unhealthy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but one consistent finding that we, we are seeing in the scientific community, uh, and I guess it's so obvious that many, many of you have probably noticed it as well, is that there are more and more reefs that are in the process of getting worse and worse. Not just here in the Caribbean, but in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, at Australia. So a lot of reefs are doing not quite well. So I would say that that is at the moment the majority of reefs, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Rene. So, so, so in, in the balance and heading in the wrong direction. Heading in the wrong direction, but it's not there yet. So I mean, that, that, that movement can be reversed. If something can become unhealthy, we can also do a lot of effort make it back healthy. And it's, we just got to try perhaps a bit harder. Thank you. Um, lovely question here. Um, again, you know, great question, but, but it's a sad sort of topic. Um, this is Freddie uh, from Holton St. Peter's School, who, who would like to know, is, is, there, is there a particular coral species that, that's more and most endangered? And is that a, a useful way to, to, to look at uh, coral health at the moment? Um, well, that's, that's a very good question, Freddie. And um, the, end, the short answer is yes, there are some coral species that are uh, much more sensitive, I would say, to all the threats we've mentioned, um, which we see, we call them indicators because they're usually the first ones to do bad. At the same time, though, the opposite also applies. There are some coral species that turn out to be incredibly resistant and very well adapted to a wide range of very bad conditions and can still function relatively well. So some are doing worse, some are doing better. And as, the, as you mentioned in the second part of your question, there is indeed a lot of focus by, not, not by me personally, by, by a lot of my colleagues, to focus on those resistant uh, corals, to try to make them more resistant or to s find out what is it that makes them so well adapted and focus on that and then try to apply it to other coral species as well. So there's, it's a great field of, of research and of focus now to try to accelerate that along. And, and for Peter, if you, if you had to name one or two species that as a class they can look at that are perhaps most endangered, um, what, what, would you, what would you point them to? I know certainly the pillar coral here on Curacao is, is getting rarer and rarer. Would, yeah. it, would that be something for them to say, you know, we, you know because I know that you know, other conservation efforts focus around the panda, focus around yeah. these very iconic species. Is there something similar in, in, with coral? Um, yeah, there are, I would, I, um, the name may not sound very familiar, but there's a group of corals that we call Acroporas, which are not so common in the Caribbean, but they're incredibly common in the Indo-Pacific region. So in the region where the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean meet, around Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Australia. And they're a very, very diverse and I would say rather beautiful group of corals. And these Acroporas are, in most cases, they seem to be particularly sensitive. They, when the temperature goes up, they're amongst the first species that do bad. Um, and yeah. I think the photographs we have from American Samoa of the bleaching. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. That's, a that's, that's an acropora field, yeah. And this, just in case you want to search for it, it's A-C-R-O-P-O-R-A. -O -O yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's a very, it's a large group of corals, I think. Uh, there's, there's probably people who are watching this and say, oh, that's not true. It's probably like 80 to 100 species of corals. So it's a very diverse group. They tend to be mostly branching corals, which means they have all these different fingers uh, and, and, and growing outwards in sort of like a, almost like a bushy form. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's around there, very, very diverse. I think on Australia, we have something like 45 species of Acropora alone. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're, we've got some questions here, uh, s some of which we've, 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 we've covered already. Um, Ishank from the Ithaca uh, Primary, one of the main factors that threaten coral, we've talked about warming driven by higher uh, carbon emissions, we've talked about overfishing, taking away the friends, we've talked about pollution from, from land, and those are sort of the, the, the sort of main, main, main threats, I would say. I, I would say so, definitely, especially anything that can be described as global, for example, global warming, is a very severe threat because it means that you can do very little locally to prevent it because it's not a it's not a problem that originates necessarily here it originates back in Europe in the United States in Asia other parts of the world and its effects so it originates there but its effects are felt here so therefore it's very difficult to do something locally because it's not a local phenomenon um. has come up, Annie, this is, this is a, uh, a very good question, and I think we're, we're coming back to, to working with our emotions again. Uh, what will happen if we don't do something to protect coral? Uh, yeah, um, I will try to answer this question in, in two ways. First of all, I would like to point out the overall loss in diversity and beauty that we are risking by losing coral reefs. Um, it's an incredibly diverse system. It would be very sad if it's not longer there because I, I would feel like we lost something. It also denies um, those of us who are interested to learn anything about it because it's not longer there. So it's, uh, it's a great loss, um, to use a difficult word, aesthetically. Uh, the sort of like added value it has for your own life, to make your own life rich. Yeah, and yeah. the richness yeah. of, of the things that you can see. You would lose that. Uh, that's for the, for the ones of us who are lucky not to depend on coral reef, because there's also the economic aspect which is perhaps not such a big thing in places like the UK because there's no coral reefs around. But in uh, the more tropical regions, there are a lot of people who depend on coral reefs for their, for their income, for their food source, for their uh, culture. Um, and when you lose all of that, these people, of course, will lose a lot more than we do because they will lose income, they have no food security, and that, that, that could be, that those are in, in potential a lot of people. It could be like up to like a tenth of the world population depend on coral reefs in one way or another. So for those people, the changes would be especially severe. Thank, thank you so much, René, and, and a lot to contemplate there, that, that, that sense of loss as well. And I, I know that the potential for loss is, is, is something that I think drives, drives it, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, the, 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 the sense of loss would be, be hard to describe. Um, it would be like losing a whole language or a whole culture. They would be, they would be so much poorer in, in things to look at. And I find that very hard to, to take in for myself. But at the same time, I feel a sense of solidarity with the people who are much worse off than I am, uh, who really risk losing everything. And, and, I, and I feel sort of more connected to those people than usual because they, they are really in the front line and, and they risk losing income, food. And, and yeah, no, that's, that's just a terrible thing. Uh, moving from that, Bella, I've noticed your question on polluting. I, th I think we've already covered it. We can come back to email our thunder if you want, after this lesson if you want more information on pollution and coral health. But I'm going to group uh, three questions here, and we've, we've got sort of a few few more minutes to end on a positive positive yeah. note. Is um, what can we do to stop coral going extinct? Um, and that brings in both uh, coral restoration. Uh, and 
turning around those sort of unhealthy weeds as well. So for, for, for classes, um, what would you say would be, we start, start going with Archie's question, is what can we do to stop uh, coral going extinct? Yeah, um, we, need to do, we need to focus on two things. On the one end, we need to stop the things that are making the reefs unhealthy because then you will sort of, um, they will automatically become more healthy if you, if you take away the unhealthy factors. At the same time, we can sort of accelerate the process of recovery by, for example, doing restoration, by taking corals that are very resilient to something, um, growing them artificially faster and then outplanting them on the reef. But we do need to work on both of these fields equally because on the one hand you cannot do a lot of restoration without tackling the problem first because everything that you do will then be offset immediately and yeah i think that's what we need to focus on both fields uh put a lot of effort into both of those at the same time and, and for some practical examples we've talked about some of the things but what, what practical examples would could you suggest uh, that, that young people uh, do, do at school or at home or in the community? Oh, there's, there's so many. Uh, where to start? Um, a good guideline would be anything that's bad for the environment is bad for coral reefs. That's a, a very easy rule of thumb. Anything you wouldn't want to throw in your own yard, don't throw it in nature. Um, we talked about carbon dioxide, which is an in, invisible problem because you don't see it. It's basically the thing that gets uh, uh, emitted by us when we use fossil fuels. So therefore, for example, things like taking the bike or the bus to school or perhaps walking once a week if the school is not too far away. Um, public transport, um, because there's many people in one bus and you get less CO2. Uh, eating more vegetarian meals, which are both delicious and healthy. And meat, as you probably have heard before, is also a great source of CO2. So all these things, uh, throw, using uh, less single-use plastic, uh, using less chemicals if you can avoid it, all these small things, you know, although they're just very small steps in your own life, when you add all of them together, they can make a big difference. And it can, you can easily do that at home. And, and, and brilliant examples there. Uh, another thing you can probably do is to, to, to write to your local representative and ask them what they're doing uh, on Coral Health Day. You know, you're, you're concerned and you've seen images that have made you sad and you've noticed differences and say, well, well, what is the, the local government, what is the national government doing to help stop reef decline? Uh, we've got one minute left Rene, um, can we end on a note of hope? Of if, course. If that, can, yeah. can, what, 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 what gives you hope? Um, well, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I wasn't hopeful that uh, something can be done about it. As we mentioned earlier, I think we discussed that the reefs are not gone. There are many reefs that are in the process of becoming unhealthy, but that's a reversible path. And if we, if we work harder on that and if we put a bit of pressure on our local governments, on our parents perhaps, on our neighbors, to each of them do their part, there's so much we can do. And, and this is not something that has been decided yet. So we know things are going bad, but we also know how to improve them. So if we do that, we can make a big difference and, and we, can, we can save coral reefs. And, and, and just, just to end here, we are at a critical point here. Yes. We are at a turning point where this isn't something that debating and talking for another few more years. This is, a, this is a, what I'd call it a now problem. It has to start now, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I, we all do our part. We perhaps should do a bit more. I think everybody could do a bit more, including myself. Um, but yeah, no, it has to happen now. We are getting close to the point where things might not be reversible, but we're not there yet. I really need to stress that out. So don't, don't despair. We are writing 
uh, as you mentioned, I think it was a friend of yours, right? Yeah. Who said? Well, it's, 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 it's uh, from, from a band, uh, which, which The Clash, which teachers will probably have heard of, but uh, students may not. Uh, and, and from their lead singer, the future is unwritten. Yeah, well, if it's unwritten, it means you can write it. And it means also that you can write it the way you want it. You know, so if we don't want to live in a future where coral reefs are gone, there's a lot of things we can do now in order to guarantee that it won't be the case. Um, but yeah, there is a... We are a bit in a hurry, I would say. Well, Rene, thank you so, so much for being part of Coral Live. Uh, it's such a, a treat to have your insights, your reflections, your message of, of, of hope and My pleasure. flipping those negative emotions into action. Thank you also to all the classes and schools and homeschoolers who have been watching. It is fantastic to have you and look forward to being part of your journey to a better coral future. But for now, it's goodbye from Coral Live and Curacao. And we'll see you again, I hope, uh, for the next lessons or in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.